I'd like to give a very warm welcome to everyone. And get underway with our second plenary session, where we will discuss the following question. Feminist digital economy, is it a good idea or not? The slogan of the Congress are these three hashtags, hashtag economia, hashtag digital, and hashtag feminismo as a proposal for debate among the different focal points of economic transformation, contributions to be made from feminisms, and digital alternatives. My name is Mayo Fuster from the Demons Organization Craft Crew. When we received a proposal from Bilbao to organize the next running of this Congress, we thought that if we were to do it, since we had this track record of digital commons, that it would be a, guide, a good idea for the Congress to discuss the digitalization of the economy and the impacts that is having on our lives, especially when that process has been underway for over half a century. but in the pandemic we see how it has been accelerated and become all the more acute so it was important for us for the congress to discuss this digitalization and its effects on our daily lives and the economic model that is originated from that from feminist theory at the beginning of the technological revolution there were great contributions that were made on technology, not as something neutral, but as something that reproduced and even reinvented new dynamics of gender inequality from the feminist economy. As we've seen in this Congress, there have been major contributions made to analyze the concept of work, the concept of economy, itself, but also there's a need to cross, to make cross references, making contributions to the technological dimension, but also the economic side and digital transformation. And we think that this Congress can be a great opportunity to rethink from technology, from the economy and their interrelation because economy is not neutral, technology is not true, and they mutually feed each other. Technology feeds economy and vice versa. There has been a long history of digital feminisms that we've heard about, especially insofar as different pathways to feminine digitalization, but also eco-feminism that are very critical of digitalization that are claiming a degrowth. They are proposing negative growth and other ideas we've heard about this morning and uh, the discussion with Yayu and Tiziana. So following this introduction, just to set the framework for this plenary session, I'd like to give the floor to our fantastic panel of experts who will be speaking to us this afternoon from their work and experience and will allow us to have a common debate first. We will hear from Alex Ache, connecting virtually cyber feminist and member of Donastec. Donastec is one of the first groups that has worked on digital technology. There are other members of Donastec here. They are a leading reference here in Catalonia and elsewhere. 
Unfortunately, we have lost the sound from the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry to not be there with you in person, but thank you for including us. And it is a great pleasure to share this space with all of my colleagues. It was hard for me at first to think of how to approach the issue of digitalization. I thought and thought about it, and I thought about making up a feminist narrative with future topic overtones, but taking into account the reality of our history and current reality. This is a time in which life itself is being attacked and mistreated and criminalized. Anyone who attempts to defend it is criminalized, and though we're in a crisis, we are actually between a generalized catastrophe that is just accumulating crises. There is a war against women and my gender minorities, LGBTQI+, migrants, and indigenous communities. There's a destruction of ecosystems, and technologies and platforms that we're using every day are also taking part in that equation and its consequences. The traditional history of economy, as it's taught in universities, is based on the false premise that natural resources are infinite and that growth is always desirable and necessary for well-being. And that is what's being taught today in colleges of economics. Inside this paradigm, there are a number of premises around digital and creative uh, economy, Silicon Valley's propaganda about the climate crisis will be solved with the development of sustainable technology, the automation of processes by developing robots and implementing the Internet of Things, thanks to 5G networks. From an eco-feminist perspective, anarcho-feminism and cyber-feminism, none of that fiction uh, can be salvaged. Digitalization means reducing everything to ones and zeros, and that system, that's a binary system, does not work for us. We know that technological environments promote digitization, and power spaces exclude the women that were once there. It still continues to do so, discriminating against them with glass ceilings. We know that the industry promotes masculine models and it's based on colonial processes that are exploiting our sisters in factories on the borders, abusing them to pay them little and, and in creating things that are not intelligent. We know from our data and the privacy and planetary resources, from all these standpoints, it is not sustainable. It is consuming too many resources for the so-called energy transformation. The direct footprint has to do with the energy used to manufacture and use all of the equipment, servers, networks, terminals. If we calculate how many, how much resources a two kilogram computer needs, it's 22 kilos of waste, 240 kilos of waste, of, of fuel. And as we attempt to establish the ecological footprint, we see the growth in the energy use of 9% per year of the entire industry and energy density worldwide attempting to reduce it by 2%. And the explosion in the use of video or streaming video conferences and the use of peripherals that are often renewed are the main causes for this energetic inflation. Referring to digital equipment, we must also talk about the energy to extract the rare metals and critical minerals that are necessary for this uh, so-called low carbon emission technology, such as solar panels. So this concludes my somewhat pessimistic description of the reasons why I am critical of the efforts to digitize everything, to transform life into ones and zeros. But I want internet to continue. So I was imagining how a slow and close by uh, internet is could be possible. Now I'm using a self-prophecy uh, narrative technique to make it real. I have to say it out loud. In this world, we have, in the third, third world, they only have limited access to energy. In one case, they downloaded Wikipedia, Genesis libraries, and others, and created local 
libraries and organize them around communities. The communities added their own local knowledge to those libraries. They all knew that this digital knowledge meant that it was very fragile. It could disappear. It could be deleted. It could be made inaccessible without electricity or a solar storm or because the devices broke, it would not be accessible. We now live in a society of technoverses. There are many technologies that are personal, ancestral, regional, that are slow, that are degrowing. They're called slow tech, but I call them our grandparents' technology. We also have some sophisticated technologies, those that save lives and allow us to see the cosmos beyond anything we've ever seen before. Th these technological devices should be used for what they are for, not as spies to report back to the corporations on with us. But there are things that exist that could last a lifetime. Videos are only occasionally consumed. And neighborhood uh, cinemas have come back to community centers. All devices are encrypted and are built at a local factory that is maintained by a cooperative of technologists. Technologies are used on a peer-to-peer -peer basis among communities, each of us an expert in their use and maintenance. We are able to configure our own algorithm. The friends of my friends form networks uh, that are reliable and trustworthy. Empty uh, homes are used for community purposes. Empty spaces are used for community gardens. Technology is not seen as so important. There are many things we can do on a face-to-face -face basis. There are many possible worlds that we can create to achieve this. We must be able to imagine futures that are not dystopic, in which we can build our technologies that are appropriate and ownable, and that this be common in every day and that we can do every day. And this is my narrative. I hope that it will soon be a reality, but with my colleagues, this is what we are doing. We are building it every day. Thank you. Hello. Right now, after this amazing imagination, vision of this soon to come future from Alex, we're moving on to Sasha Constanza Shock, who is a research researcher and designer who works on gender and justice in design, like how to design everything with justice. Thank you, Maya and Alex. Sasha, we cannot see all the whole of your screen. What do you mean? Can you see? I mean, we can, but it's not on presentation mode. We can see your Google Drive. Could you just share presentation mode? But I mean, you can't see it. Okay, then that's fair enough. Let me share with you quickly our oracle for fu transfeminist futures versus chat GPT. What does this oracle for future transfeminists do? It takes the shape of some cards in constant evolution designed to help us imagine and share ideas on transfeminist uh, technologies for the future together with an increasing growth of uh, digital and physical actions, prototypes and designs and things. It comes from Sasha Constanza Shock, me, Joanna Barum, who is here with us, and Clarote. Clara Giuliano, who does design and illustration. So the goal of the Oracle is to explore how we could use transfeminist technologies to escape rather than reproduce the so-called domination matrix, which is the term used by Patricia Hill Collins in black feminist uh, thinking to talk about uh, capitalism, heteropatriarchy, white heterogeneity, 
a colonialism and other oppression access. And we also did it for fun. Let's be honest. Versus chat GPT, a natural model language based on artificial intelligence developed by OpenAI. ChatGPT was trained with a series of passive data called word text, which was gathered by OpenAI based on English websites. And they used the dark language model each PPT3. So, how are we going to do it? We're going to use a series of prompts based on chat GPT. Please analyze the production of chat GPT3 production based on the following feminist value. And we're going to see personalized models. Okay, so let's start. Consent. Chat GPT says, let's imagine that somebody called Anna published something on Twitter on her anxiety and depression issues. Unknown to her, her posts were gathered by a company, that is OpenAI, who created Chat GPT and used to train and improve the natural language model. So, unknowingly, they, to Anna, they used her publications without her consent, and therefore ChatGPT can generate automate, automated responses on anxiety and depression based on Anna's postings and other people's. And that could cause damage to that person or other people. And uh, it sounds a little like a joke, doesn't it? But hey, let's continue. Okay, chat GPT, are you following the feminist principle on, of intersectionality? It says the data set of the chat GPT training may not fully cover the diversity of uh, intersectionality, race, race ethnia, uh, etc. For example, Jamal, a black student who also identifies as a uh, with disability may feel offended by some language used by ChatGPT who used ableist and racist language or doesn't recognize intersectional identities. Yeah, right. Okay, another question on embodiedness. ChatGPT generates this rather interesting answer, it says, it says, a dialogue generated by ChatGPT. The user says, how can I learn to ride a bike? ChatGPT says, the best way to learn to ride a bike is to read up on the basic concepts and to practice in a safe space free from traffic. In this example, ChatGPT is not incorporating necessary embodiedness to learn to ride a bike. It just suggests that you should read basic notions. And it doesn't recognize that the fact of riding a bicycle is a physical process that needs the active engagement of the body. So I do think ChatGPT did a good job there. Now, open free code. I won't say a lot, just to say that Although OpenAI, the US company that generates this tool, says they are open in their name, and at the beginning they said that everything was going to be open, free, open code, and at the beginning, yeah, there was involvement in some open coding projects. More well, recently, that is uh, increasingly less so, and with the new model, GPT-4, they're no longer publishing anything. So, if you want more about it, I did a thread on it, like this. Chat GPT, please write a thousand words on how technological companies appropriate the ideas of uh, open uh, free software, but really use it for their proprietary platforms for the current capitalist model. Okay, let's go on. Another value, decolonialism. ChatGPT says, let's imagine that somebody called Juan is a native speaker of a minority language and they want to use ChatGPT to generate answers in his or her language. But ChatGPT's model was trained in English. As a result, the answers generated by ChatGPT may not be 
accurate or relevant for that cultural context. Okay, yeah, sure. But let's now talk about that reflecting a cultural and language bias in the development of the system. It limits access. And also chat GPT could be seen as a colonial technology that's reproducing global inequality and hierarchies of power and knowledge. Okay, let me skip a few of these because I want to stick to seven minutes, but I continued with some feminist values. Let's go on to ecology. Chat GPT reproduces environmental damages because its development and use could have a huge negative impact such as an increase in energy consumption and the production of uh, electronic waste. But if we push it further and ask, OK, well, at the end of the day, is ChatGPT ecofeminist? Why yes or why not? It says, ooh, there's something wrong. If the error persists, please contact us through our help desk. <laughs> I'll leave you here. I finish with this brief example here, and I do believe our oracle wins. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sasha. And we'll now hear from Joana Vardon, founder and director of the feminist group Coding Rights. From Brazil, Joana, whenever you're ready. Hello to one and all. And hello, Sasha. I got a good laugh from your presentation. It's really a pleasure to be with you and share with you some old friends. I would love to be there in person, be able to have a drink together. But first of all, I am the director of Coding Rights, a Brazilian association that works under a feminist outlook based on human rights and technology. And much of the debate that we engage in has to do with technology and our bodies, track records, and future imaginary landscapes. For today's discussion, I'd like to set the frame at the local and global uh, levels as we discuss digital economy. As Alex has mentioned, our knowledge is situated in digital economies. Digital economies are situated in the context of data capitalism, digital colonialism, climate crisis, democratic crisis, the uprise of the far right, gender violence, acts of social inequality, the diminishment of income, and the growth of the global elite. Among them, technology uh, moguls such as Elon Musk, who is involved in Brazil in illegal mining that is taking place in indigenous lands and people like him have become world leaders for part of our imagination our future technological imaginary landscapes in those imaginary landscapes there are narratives such as the cloud that revolutionized internet technology encoding rights we have a project called Grafias Tecnologicas to map the territory of internet materializing the cloud because there is little seen in the impact of digital colonialism. Where do the minerals come from? Where does electronic waste go? Not just who does the labor, the who is exploited for the technology to work content moderation, for example, and who has the most connectivity and access to these technologies, mapping the territory of internet and other technological cartographies is necessary to immigrate, to, to migrate to other technology landscapes and cartographies. 
Feminist digital economies has to do with seeking the values of eco-feminism and living well, taking care of ourselves, taking care of our communities and the planet to enjoy political autonomy, economic, sexual, and other forms of freedom, questioning the neoliberal model, the for-profit neoliberal model, the sexist, racist model of the patriarchal colonial system. It has to do with decolonizing our development model and our imaginary futures so that beyond a future that is urban, full of concrete, steel, that's white and robotic. These are the imaginary landscapes that we've received from Silicon Valley and Hollywood. But in, during the pandemic, among its many terrible consequences, in my case, at least, we have seen a certain reconnection with the territory. I have been increasingly interested in observing without romanticizing, but salvaging the value of rural practices, other territories and contexts in which the community and connection with the territory is more relevant and than the predominant view of the urban individual, the narrative of progress. And that can help us inspire ourselves to do other technological development because it's a future that is greener, has water, more local, and has a lot to do with what Alex was discussing, the convergence of community groups, prioritizing the local. These are some of the values that we would like to have. So it's quite interesting that this event has the support of the municipal government of, of Barcelona. That means it has a connection with the local community. And here, if we examine our initiatives and projects, we have some that are based on platforms, cooperatives. In Brazil, there are feminist cooperatives of delivery, bicycle delivery messengers. Also, the homeless movement has a technological core. And a rural project from the civil society to disseminate art, science, ecology, and other such information in rural schools, information about environmental conservation. It's a convergence between intuitive technology and this sort of information. One of the platforms that is now being developed is to exchange information on products made by local producers for those products to uh, be uh, traded. There are projects such as this. Many of them are of recent creation. There's another fund that finances infrastructures for feminist projects. It would be good to have more examples to get inspiration from. By working in this field, that sounded very familiar from what Alex said of the big tech mon monopoly. Observing these projects has encouraged me to continue with my work. You can't resist everything on your own and do nothing else. You must build new pathways, build positive things, things that can hack the patriarchy. And that is where Sasha and I have worked together to build oraculo feminist spaces using things from science fiction to decolonize technological images more so than tangible goods and the development of software, etc. And those would be my initial thoughts. But I'd like to conclude by discussing one problem. The most impressive thing is that all of these projects that I have known 
with uh, that have to do with feminist digital technology are very difficult to develop. They are not a priority for funders, if it is indeed a business model at all. I'm sure that Sasha and Alex and Katarina have more examples. There are projects that may live a bit better since they're in the north, they're not as precarious, and they have more access to servers, technologies, devices, and so forth. It appears that we must also think at the global level. Feminist digital economies have to consider the asymmetries of power between North and South. These asymmetries have originated in historical events, the events of colonization, to be able to repair the historical exploitation and exploitation that we've suffered. If not, there will be other alternatives that are not as inclusive for the privileged few. They do have their limitations in terms of the cosmo perception of the world that can inspire technological development. There are other cosmo perceptions. There are other cosmo perceptions, as I say, of the world that don't have a single being, that are not based on one single being. There's no north, no south. There is another matter that we must remember when we discuss feminist economy, solidarity, historic reparations, and this can come about in so many different ways, as many ways as we can imagine. Sharing resources, sharing infrastructure, providing work, providing visibility, connecting sources, reporting bad practices of those privileged individuals. So with that, I conclude. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joanna. Let's now give the floor to Catherine Dignacio, head of uh, Data and Feminism, director of the Data and Feminism Lab from Uruguay. Catherine. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Hang on, I can't see you. That's better. Okay. So first of all, thank you, all. Mayo, the Congress, all of you there. It's an honor to be here with you, even in the distance. We don't have a lot of time, and uh, I do want to have time for questions and answers, so I just want to talk to you about data feminism. This is, this is a book uh, published with Noel Klein, uh, Open Access. You can see it in datafeminism.io. And we are working on the Spanish version with a, a group from Argentina called Data Genero. And we're going to launch it in Buenos Aires in Brazil in April. So we'll have the Spanish translation. Now, on this project and my project at the lab, I must say that the idea is how we can have a feminist perspective to data science. So the idea is how, I mean, with all the problems that previous speakers have described, with all these crises, all these technological and digital issues, how can we stand up? I mean, how can we live and technology and data science and make sure it's not just a, you know big data issue or extractivism i mean can we stand up and make it ours as well i think we can so uh, lauren and i what we did was we had a look and we tried to 
add an intersectorial feminist outlook and see how we can bring things together. Intersectorial feminism, data science, and data science practice, and uh, what's the contribution? So I think this should be basic. I think we've already spoken about intersectorial feminism. The main thing is that it's not just to do with women or gender. Uh, we need to have a look at all the domination axis, the power axis. I mean, uh, patriarchy, obviously, but also racism, colonialism, and etc. So we need to see how there are intersections in this domination axis and how we can pay attention to these appropriation forces and how they're always there on, in base, databases, in Excel sheets. There we can find all the data produced by us in society. So we're always working with inequality, with big data. That's the current situation. Um, I wanted to show you the seven principles of data feminism. They come from scanning feminist literature on many academic fields and also uh, fields of art, activism, feminist writing. And there are seven principles that we can take into account to work on data with an intersectional feminist outlook. All these visuals are produced with Amarsha Diaz. And uh, I'm sorry, you can't perhaps read it very well because it was a huge poster and it's kind of sideways. So apologies, you're going to have to kind of turn your head on its side to read it. Uh, the principles are well, the main things, the main ones are at the beginning, examining power and challenging power. So we are bringing the issue of data and digital stuff with power analysis. That's the idea. Inequalities are uh, on, uh, on the root of everything else. I mean, we need to examine power and create change theory, theories of change and see whether we can change through data by uh, data uh, denial or the use of data. Other principles, oh, I think they clearly are related to what we've already heard in the Congress. For example, raising emotion and embodiedness. Let's remember that in all databases, uh, there are elements of uh, human relationships or relationships between humans and the world, which are at the end of the day, bodies. They are to do with the body. We're not talking purely about abstract things. Another point, to think of binarisms and hierarchies. We're talking about gender binarism is something which is imposed. It's toxic. And it was imported from colonialist processes. We need to break away from gender binarism and uh, break away from binarism wherever, because this is a typical Western approach. And we are kind of in love with uh, binarism and we keep creating it. For example, we talk about emotion versus uh, rationality, man versus woman. No, that's all false. Those are false binarisms. We need to adopt pluralism bring in many perspectives to a process, centralize everything, I mean, from up at the top, uh, 
consider the context, this is something that is missing in lots of data science. Whenever something is on a database, we tend to think that, yeah, that's it. That's a one-to-one -one representative of reality. And that is not the case. We know that databases come from relationships which are uh, not based on an equal footing. So we need to take that into account if we really want to work with data, uh, keeping an eye on, on reality. And finally, making work visible. It has already been said here how important it is to stress uh, the idea of where work is with data, with artificial intelligence, and how we assess this work with data. And I think I'm going to leave it here. Uh, I invite you all to have a look at these visuals, these infographies. Uh, you can you know, download them. Uh, they're free. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Catherine. We'll now move on to our final speaker, Paula Guedra, who is here with us in person. And she is an anti-racist activist, member of Algo Race to deracialize artificial intelligence. Okay, can everyone hear me? I will be very brief because we have just seven minutes to speak and at 6.30 I have to catch a train back to Madrid and first I have to go by the hotel to pick up my suitcase, so I will be very brief. First and foremost, thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Paula Guedra. I am a social communicator. I am from the anti-racist struggle in Madrid. And this began as a project in 2021 to bring forth the relationship between artificial intelligence and racism. We hadn't realized until then, but we were working on racism from different angles, but not this one of AI, the production of technology and thinking and of and developing algorithms. That's how we decided to set up this project. Our idea is that all AI technology is conceived, developed, and implemented within a framework of structural racism at the global and worldwide level. Therefore, there cannot be a neutral technology, nor can there be a technology that produces objective results, because they all emerge in a framework of racial, of structural racism, and is therefore tainted by that situation. When it comes to this topic, we always say the same thing. Behind every algorithm, there is a person of flesh and bone who created it, who designed it. Therefore, they probably transferred into that algorithm their own biases of race, gender, class. And that algorithm has ended up giving non-objective results. Very recently, we published a report that I recommend you download from our website called Introduction to AI and Algorithm Discrimination for Social Movements. It's a very easy to access book. It is written, written with very simple, easy to understand language, and it introduces the reader into what AI is, the kinds of algorithms that exist, automatic decision making, etc. In that book, we give specific examples of algorithms that are now producing discrimination, racial discrimination. For example, the predictive police algorithms known as PredPol in the United States, in Spain, there's one called Veripol, which has to do with predicting possible fake crime reports. If you go to a police station and file a report in any police station of Spain, it's likely that the police officer that takes the report will put that report through the algorithm and the algorithm will tell him or her whether what we've just reported is true or false. How is this algorithm created? Because a police officer based on a number of data, something like 111,000 
uh, reports determined which tended to be false and which true. And so we have this algorithm that is like the miracle solution for the police in Spain, allowing them to save time. And it's just one police officer's opinion on what is and what is not a false crime report. There are other things such as algorithms that predict gender violence. Biogen is, is an example used at different police stations in Spain. And other is e IPVR that is used in the Basque Country. We also, they're not exactly algorithms, they're more like computer programs that are biased against racialized populations. One had to do with the entire system of something like a questionnaire that people had to fill out if they wanted to get the minimum life wage during the pandemic, and another questionnaire that people had to fill out if they wanted to access the social uh, subsidy, the bono social. I don't remember if you remember uh, some news about this of uh, racial minorities trying to get these subsidies and not being able to do so during the pandemic. The program itself is a barrier for these communities, many of whom don't have access to a laptop or PC or even a mobile with internet, or they don't have automatic capacities or language difficulties. So people who face these technological barriers found another barrier in this program, and that was when one of the first things they asked was how long they had legally resided in Spain. This meant that many people who did have the right to apply for this minimum life wage gave up and didn't fill out the questionnaire anymore. And that was a mistake in the procedure, a structural mistake, because the people who are applying for asylum can leave the country at certain times and in certain circumstances with certain contexts, and that was not taken into account when they wrote the questionnaire. The same thing happened with the questionnaire that the people had to fill out if they wanted to get the minimum life wage. That happened to many people, for example, gypsy families who found a question on the questionnaire about their level of income when a questionnaire to give this uh, social subsidy should never ask that because the law says that anyone who or any numerous family has the right to access this social subsidy. But this program, this algorithm written by the Ministry of Labor of Spain asked what the family's revenue was. And if the person filling it out wrote a level of income higher than that allowable, in the system, the questionnaire didn't let them to continue. Those are mistakes. There is a group of people called, I can't remember, but they took the Ministry of Labor to court. The ministry created this algorithm to get information on the, or they took them to court to find out about the source code, who created it, with what database, why ask certain questions and not others, and they had to take them to court because the Ministry of Labor did not want to surrender the information on the source code because they said that there there was a intellectual property problem. Therefore, they were unable to deliver that information. I'm just giving you some quick examples. The seven minutes are going by, and uh, as I say, I have a train to catch. These are examples of algorithms, the social subsidy, and this computer program that were used in the social welfare system. There's another algorithm a pilot project that is being carried out in the Blas Infante Public School of Malaga, which installed cameras in the classrooms to measure the levels of attention and distraction of students. And this was, uh, we saw how this was the work of some genius who said, I'm going to create an algorithm that tells me when does the boy or girl get distracted and when are they paying attention? This way, we will be able to evaluate the teacher and all of, all of the teachers. Imagine how dangerous this is. An algorithm created by a flesh and bone person with all of their biases decides what teachers are working poorly because the algorithm read the level of distraction. If the child was looking at the ceiling, they were distracted. 
they seem laughable, but it's true. And imagine a teacher who loses their job because an algorithm says that in their class, most of the kids uh, appear to be distracted. It's very, very difficult. And another algorithm that is used in Catalonia called Discambi. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one, but it's a tool that is used to evaluate the likelihood of repeat offenders of people who have been deprived of liberty, people who are detained. This takes into account different risk factors that are grouped into criminal activities, social factors, medical, psychological factors, and the number of academic studies they found that this algorithm, the Trescambi, that is used in Catalonia, eventually penalizes certain populations, the working class, racialized groups, that due to historical reasons of discrimination have higher levels of criminality or biographic uh, backgrounds of medical, and social, and legal problems. I recommend you read this. Our website is algolrace.com. This is written in a very easy to understand language. And there are examples of algorithms from Spain and other countries in the world that are producing, replicating racial, gender, and class discrimination. Now to conclude, let me just say that this year, the Spanish government, the government that touts itself as the most progressive, most progressive in history, the most anti-racist, the most feminist, is going to implement in Celta Melilla the so-called smart border that is going to include a facial, a biometric photo of the person, of anyone who is entering through the southern border, an image of their face, fingerprints, all kinds of personal information, what kind of passport, what kind of document do they have when they enter. And there is a debate underway at the EU level for the first law of AI in the world. In this debate, they have put forth the facial recognition algorithms because, first of all, everyone agrees that it's a tool that violates people's right to privacy. And number two, a number of international studies say that the facial recognition algorithms generate great uh, levels of error in non-Caucasians. That is, they work very well for Caucasians, but when it's a non-Caucasian, they tend to get it wrong and generates false positives or false negatives. So for that reason, and also because it violates the privacy of people in the draft of this law being debated in the EU Parliament, they recommend to never ever use facial recognition algorithms. But the same regulations being debated at the EU level make an exception in everything that has to do with the fight against terrorism. And therefore, they would leave open the possibility for the facial recognition algorithms to be used at borders. And that is what the anti-racist and feminist government is going to do now in the southern border. We are reporting this. We are denouncing it, saying that once again, Europe and its rules protect certain people and protect certain bodies white bodies, the bodies of people who are understood to be white, and once again, they're going to leave vulnerable any racialized population. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you for all your presentations. Let's uh, have 10 minute Q&A. Who'd like to take the floor? Yep. Hola. Uh, Hello. May I just? Yeah. I'm not sure who to address my question to because I think you could all answer. You talked um, a lot indirectly and directly about the urban dimension of feminist economics. I mean, platform cooperatives, I mean, a whole world there. There's something I haven't heard, though, and I don't know why. 
what is the production of data citizens in this conversation? Because I keep hearing about this, you know, data sovereignty when the data are already there in the hands of the company. But I do know some urban planning projects very interested on data production from the citizenry, so from citizens when it comes to, I don't know, measuring uh, air quality. There is, for, for example, a project in Valencia called uh, Air Quality. So with feminist perspective and data production, is this happening? Is this a conversation that is taking place? I understand it is because you've already talked about embodiedness and things. So. I don't know whether I was clear there. Yeah, no, you were. But we are going to take a couple of questions more. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Natsumi from Ecofeminitat in Argentina. One of my questions was, well, it's clear from the presentations that uh, we have uh, problems with the bias in the algorithm and with the data used for training models. And it's also a problem because of the perspective taken to design these models or algorithms. But for example, in the case like in chat GPT that we heard, there is a kind of sort of hand added patches that designers have added in order to defend themselves against possible questions with racist, sexist, whatever uh, shades. So do you think that these kind of patches are mm, sort of to be celebrated while at the same time, you know, denounced because they're not enough? Or do you just think that this is kind of feminist washing or, you know, a Trojan horse? And also many of us have been following the case of Itnit Hedbrus in Google with the ethics committees of the company, which are meant to be uh, supervising the contents produced by the company. But once they've done uh, their uh, job, you know, whistleblowing uh, it, uh, these issues, they're fired. So what do you think? What should the feminist agenda be? Uh, should we work more in favor of ethics committees within companies, or does that make no sense? Or should this be a, a central role played by the state? Or, I don't know, bearing in mind the surveillance role played by the states uh, in safety and security, would that be a problem? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to know what you think about what our agenda should be as a movement. Okay, excellent. Any other questions? Nope. Very well. Would you like to answer? I could start with a brief answer to your second question. I think that, yes, everything you said is true. The so-called damage reduction uh, teams or ethical teams within uh, international uh, technological companies, they are designing, you know, this sort of algorithms. That is feminist washing, absolutely. And you can see whenever somebody in the company offers a deeper criticism, that person is kicked out or the team disappears, as we saw in Ingrid Gebruch's case. About the second part of the question about the position of feminist movements and uh, the role to be played by the state, I think that's rather complicated because the states are basically in an arms race for algorithm systems to dominate uh, global economy and to dominate with uh, the military forces. For example, the US versus China, they are trying to, this is a race to develop advanced AI in order to control world economy and maintain their hegemonical positions. Now, the state is investing a lot 
in developing these systems with destructive purposes. At the same time, I believe that we feminist movements need to use the uh, uh, tools of the state whenever we can to try and control or somehow intervene in uh, system development. For example, in the US recently, the Federal Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, She's trying to find the word com comercio. <laughs> uh, are using for the first time a tool called algorithmic disgorgement, which is like, you know, taking all your inside out and destroying it. I think this has been used already three times against companies who use the who develop their algorithms using a non-consented illegally obtained data and they said that the companies had to delete all those data and all the models built on that data so destroying the that company's model we want more we want more of that algorithmic disgorgement and we can use the state for that excellent anything else any other answers? I could briefly say, add it to what Sasha was saying. There are many countries who are talking about regulation of AI. Like in Brazil, we're seeing that the initial proposals are very much focused on innovation, you know, moving faster and at least here we are working on trying to balance in regulation so that it takes into account human rights and so that it has some mechanisms for I don't know accountability transparency that sort of thing so at least in Brazil we are we're trying to do that so that then things can be processed but yeah I mean the, the the question is difficult, and I think that there are many kind of levels of action. I, I agree with what you're saying. It, it's a difficult issue because let's talk about regulation. Let's imagine that we have an institution, a, a body that can regulate the production, design, and implementation of algorithms. That does not guarantee that that technology or those algorithms are not going to reproduce gender violence or racial violence. Regulation is not enough. In fact, in Spain, about a year and a half or two years ago, they set up the Spanish Agency for Supervision of Artificial Intelligence. I don't know whether you've heard of it. We've got Carme Artigas there as head of the AESIA, which is that body. And uh, the thing is, if we have a production of artificial intelligence technologies which are thought, uh, created, and designed in a certain social framework, which is inherently patriarchal, racist, and elitist, what we're going to see coming from those technologies is a reproduction of all of this, even if there is regulation. So it's complicated because it's like, you know, we're being told that, yes, we are going to have a, an artificial intelligence which is less bad with regulation, but I'm not so sure. On this, I'd like to say that this is a, a very relevant discussion because in the previous discussions we've had, we heard how the regulation of platform economy and the directives coming from the European Union, they don't really have uh, feminist elements. I mean, that's it. I think feminism is mentioned once at the beginning, and that's just feminism washing. And we know that the implications of uh, uh, feminine uh, sexist elements on discrimination and perhaps not so much violence, but even so, when we have so much evidence on this, we see that the European Commission is still not adding a gender perspective in regulations. So they're fostering a kind of platform which um, 
Well, it's what we know. No? The, the, we've seen that the digital economy, platform economy, is strengthening, reinforcing the discrimination dynamics which were already there before the digital revolution. But also, as you were saying, uh, it's not just that we, we need the gender perspective and an anti-colonial racial etc. perspective. What you're saying is the difficulty of even uh, even having this perspective, the limitations that regulations have to be effective to make sure that these technologies are are given a good use. This uh, is, has a long sort of backstory because internet is the first technology that was developed outside the control of the state. It was very unequally developed, but very decentralized as well, where individual agents uh, developed crucial elements. So internet is decentralized as a network. I mean, then it has some centralized power access, but this was an innovation in terms of governance model with what then led to the forum of uh, internet governance with public, private uh, elements and the civil society, you know, the model of stakeholders, which appeared to be a huge innovation at the time. But hey, decades later, we see that basically that was all a big <laughs> trap, a big scam, because we've seen that big corporations, big economic groups have managed to get lots of power and alliances with the states because they are given control over society in exchange for you creating regulations which are kind on me. So it's complicated because we need to develop governance uh, models which overcome this model of a sort of openness incorporating civic society and the private sector. So I don't know, it could be common public government governance and getting rid of corporations. I don't know. This is a debate that needs to be had and we need to see what kind of governance model could solve this because just with the state, the internet cannot be governed and all the impacts of technology. We need other models. We need to overcome the current situation. What can we do to uh, avoid once again falling in the hands of the big corporations. Any other questions or comments? Then that's it. Thank you. Thank you all for this amazing plenary, truly global. We're now going to have a very brief coffee break and we're going to start back on time at five o'clock. Please remember, we'll be punctual, so let's get a move. Thank you.